Welcome everyone. My name is David Politzer. I'm the director of the School of Art at the University of Houston. I want to welcome everyone to the first event in our fall speaker series, a le uh, lecture and conversation with writer and critic Aruna D'Souza. I think we can all agree that attending speaking events through our screens is different. Um, I want to acknowledge here the benefits of that difference. First, we're streaming on Facebook and YouTube. So we're bringing these speakers to a wider audience, welcoming the world into our community here at the University of Houston. So welcome to those of you who are watching via those outlets. And welcome to those of you who are multitasking while listening, walking the dog, doing the dishes, driving, whatever. Thanks for joining us. In this format, we're able to bring you visitors who may not otherwise be able to come to Houston because of their busy schedules or commitments to their own families and or communities. And the School of Art faculty saw this as an opportunity to reach out to these folks, embrace the medium and seize the moment. Later this semester, we welcome design activist, Dean Nichols on September 24th artist Nicholas Gallinan on October 15th, artist Derek Adams on October 22nd. And I invite you to check the events page on the School of Art website for more information. And that's where you'll find all the links to connect to the upcoming talks. And I think you can probably get that in your chat, in the chat box there. So a few notes about how tonight is going to run. Um, for those of you who've never been in a webinar, this is a webinar. It looks a little different than uh, a normal meeting. Um, you probably notice that you're muted. You don't have all the buttons and privileges that you normally do. Um, but we encourage you to use the chat during the session and to kick it all off, I invite you to type now, if you would, tell us where you are and uh, where, you're, where you're beaming in from. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to let you know that you uh, that we're recording the session and it'll be available on the uh, UH YouTube channel after the talk. Um, for the Q&A, <clears throat> which is a separate panel, you'll see that. If you'd like to ask a question live, use the raise hand button and then we'll, we'll invite you to unmute your mic. We'll also monitor the Q&A box and we're happy to ask questions for you if you type it in the box. The only caveat to all this is that if you're running an older version of Zoom, you may not be able to raise your hand uh, or join with your voice. If that's the case, just type your question into the Q&A panel. And I see somebody is already using the Q&A panel mm -hmm. and people are using the chat too, which is great. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Sandra Zalman, Professor of Art History. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Sandra Zalman, Director of the Art History Program at the University of Houston. Each year, the Art History Program invites a distinguished guest, a scholar, critic, or curator to campus to lead a seminar with our master's students and give a public lecture. Our Master's in Art History program is about to celebrate its 10th year, and our alumni have gone on to PhD programs at Rice University, Florida State, Northwestern, and CUNY. Other alums now work at the Kimball Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts, or even run their own galleries. This year, our lecture looks a little different, and our audience comes from far beyond the University of Houston, and it is fun to see where everyone is in the chat. Um, and knowing that our event this year would be different, my colleagues Dana Frankfurt in painting and Julian Conrad in sculpture proposed that we collaborate to bring Aruna D'Souza to our virtual campus. So it is my absolute pleasure tonight to introduce Aruna D'Souza, one of the most important voices in contemporary art today. D'Souza writes cogently and critically about both current issues and historical work. For example, her co-edited volume the Invisible Flanneaux, Gender, Public Space, and Visual Culture in 19th Century Paris, asked hard questions about the role of women in the space of modernity. Her 2014 co-edited volume, Art History in the Wake of the Global Turn, 
argued for a more inclusive discipline. And her crucial book, White Walling, Art, Race, and Protest in Three Acts, was named one of the best art books of 2018 by the New York Times and is now in its third printing. Congratulations. Um, White Walling has made such an impact on the field that there will be an entire panel devoted to it at the next conference of the College Art Association. And um, submissions are still open if anybody wants to apply to that panel. Tonight, D'Souza will speak about the artist Lorraine O'Grady, whose work was featured in the exhibition Soul of a Nation, which recently closed at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston after a two year run that began at the Tate Modern. D'Souza is currently editing a book of O'Grady's writing. In the introduction to the book, D'Souza includes O'Grady's feedback on her first attempt at the text. And I'm just gonna quote what O'Grady said because it's just so perfect. This is her, I assume she emailed this to you. It's an email. Okay, this is Lorraine O'Grady. Basically the text splits in two. There are about 28 paragraphs. The first 13 or so are about as first draft as you can get. You could drop them and no one would hear a splash. <laughs> Episodic and then, and then, and then, and nothing but description that's not providing answers because it's not asking questions. Suddenly, in paragraph 14, the first sign of real critical thinking, gradually it gets better and better until by paragraph 20 or so you are flying. The last paragraphs are about as close to first class as the first half is to less than first draft. <laughs> so <laughs> I read this in the introduction that Arona D'Souza wrote to Lorena Grady's forthcoming uh, collected writings. And I was just completely blown away. Not only is O'Grady's feedback, incisive and funny and poetic all at the same time. Um, but as an arts writer myself, I found it just like incredibly brave that you included it in the text as a meta commentary on the act of writing itself. Um, because, you know, we all know that writing is challenging work and it just takes guts to do it well. Asking the tough questions while also letting the joy of discovery find the reader. Um, but I've just never seen like so much honesty in a text. And um, I think it's what makes your writing so invigorating. And of course the introduction sort of ends with you saying that you completely rewrote it <laughs> um, according to Lorraine O'Grady's incisive feedback. And um, I just love that openness about your critical voice. So without further ado, I, uh, Welcome you to the University of Houston um, and our Zoom presentation. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you for um, everyone for having me and thank you for that lovely introduction. And you missed out one descriptor when it comes to when it came to Lorraine's feedback and that was brutal, brutal. It was brutal. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that was a sort of key part of it as well. So let's not forget that part. Right. Um, but um, so I, you know, um, the White Walling was launched in May of 2018. And for the launch event, um, my publisher, who is the artist Paul Chan, um, through his press, Badlands Unlimited, he wanted to do an, a launch event at the Brooklyn Museum that he had arranged for it there. And he wanted to do a, he wanted me to stand up and do a reading. And I was so uncomfortable with this idea for a lot of reasons, partly because one of the things about white walling that I was really wanting to avoid was um, taking on the position of authority in relation to um, the subject matter. Um, I really felt myself to be a conduit for a lot of other people making a lot of really important arguments. And I want, and, and so I, I really didn't like the idea of um, being on that stage alone. So I invited two people um, who I had had very little contact with up until that point. One was the artist Devin Kenny. Um, and another was Lorraine O'Grady. And, um, you know, I had asked Lorraine if she would take part in this event with me. And, you know, no one at, at this point, the book hadn't come out, people hadn't read it. So no one really knew how people were going to react to it. There was a lot of 
I, there was a lot of paranoia, I think, about like somehow people knew I was writing the book and somehow there was paranoia that I was going to be like, you know, you know, slash and burning the art world or something like that. And so, um, and so I was sort of hesitant, you know, I was, I was sort of hesitant about asking people because I didn't want them to bring them into what might end up being potential drama that they didn't need to be in. But at the same time, I really felt like <clears throat> um, some of the people who had been such important commentators around the, the, the the most recent controversy that I talk about in the book, which is the 2017 biennial, also be part of the, these conversations um, as the book was launched. So I wrote to Lorraine and um, she wrote back and she said, you know, I couldn't possibly, in order to be up on that stage, I would have to read the book at least four times. And I'm not sure that I have enough time to, to, to read it four times. And I'm thinking, I don't think I've read it four times, right? Like she, and so she, but she said, so I, I really couldn't possibly, I would really love to do it, but I really couldn't possibly. And then at the end she said, PS, um, this is a strange coincidence, but I also have a branch of my family from Jamaica whose last name is D'Souza. And I thought, what an amazing thing, right? Here's a black woman from Jamaica and a South Asian woman from South India um, who are connected by this name in their family trees, right? So I wrote back to her and I said, oh, that's so interesting. And are you sure you don't wanna do the event? And then she was like, yeah, okay, I'll do the event. So, <laughs> so that was, so on the stage of the Brooklyn Museum was the first real time that we had a substantial conversation about art um, and protest and politics and race. And um, it was uh, sort of amazing. Lorraine is obviously brilliant and brilliant both as a theorist as well as as, as an artist. And shortly after that, um, you know, she uh, we talked about um, her book of collected writings. She asked me to take part in her book of collected writings as the editor, and um, I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing this work, I'm going to just ask a friend uh, how to go about pitching a retrospective of her work, because Lorraine, uh, for all the importance of her work um, to so many moments in uh, post-1980 art, has never had a full-on large-scale museum retrospective, and she's in her 80s. And so I called up my friend to say, how does one go about pitching an exhibition? Because I'd never curated an exhibition before. And my friend, Catherine Morris said, this is the perfect exhibition for the Brooklyn Museum for a lot of reasons. One was because they had recently included her work in Soul of the Nation, as well as We Wanted a Revolution. They, because of the strength of their Egyptian collection, they own a piece of, of Lorraine's miscegenated family album. And um, Brooklyn is the home of a very large um, Caribbean community and Lorraine's, uh, both her heritage, but also her work um, is very tied to uh, her Jamaican ancestry. So, um, so suddenly here I was a week after White Walling comes out, um, with two projects on, on the horizon. One is her collected writings and one is the retrospective. Um, and um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about those two projects and the sort of um, the, the major contours of her uh, career and also um, some of the challenges involved in trying to um, pin her down um, in the form of a book of collected writings and an exhibition. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So I'm showing you what will ultimately be the back cover of the Lorraine O'Grady exhibition. It's titled Both And for reasons that I'll let you know in, the, in a minute. Um, and I'm showing you the back cover because 
the front cover will have an image that is under strict embargo until the exhibition opens. And that is because uh, Lorraine will be debuting a new and major body of work that is, I can say, spectacular. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but uh, she um, has put us under strict instructions that no images of the um, work are meant to circulate, which has been a complicated thing. We weren't even allowed to show other colleagues at the museum what this work looked like um, until finally the director of the museum was like, okay, look, I'm putting on this exhibition. I need to know what this work looks like. So we managed to, to, to get permission to show it to her. Um, and on the right is the cover of Lorraine O'Grady's Writing in Space, which is the collected writings that will be published by Duke University Press. And on the cover of that uh, Duke University Press book is uh, our images from what is probably one of her most well-known works. Now, Lorraine um, graduated from Wellesley um, in the uh, 1950s, um, went on to work for the US Department of State um, as an intelligence analyst. Um, left that to uh, try and write a novel. And when she decided she didn't have the skills to write the novel, entered the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is one of the top creative writing programs in the US um, to get her MFA in writing. Um, left that to go to Chicago and uh, start working as a translator. Um, and uh, ran a small translation business in Chicago, and then moved to New York in the 70s with a boyfriend who was a music executive, and she began writing rock criticism. Um, and the beginning, I mean, her deciding to become a rock critic involved her walking into the Village Voice one day and saying, I want to write rock criticism, and here's my first um, try and they said, okay, this is great. You're a rock critic now. And so she wrote rock criticism for a while. Her first published piece in The Voice was a review of um, Bob Marley and the Whalers opening for um, Bruce Springsteen, one of Bruce Springsteen's first um, concerts at, that took place at CBGB's. So she was a rock critic and then she started getting interested in um, the art scene uh, and began working as a volunteer really at just above Midtown Gallery, which was an important art gallery uh, and, and site for Black avant-garde artists in New York um, in that sort of 70s, 80s, uh, especially run by a woman named Linda Good Bryant. And uh, eventually decided that she wanted to um, start making art herself. So here's a woman who made her first artwork, did her first performance art piece, basically at the age of 45 years old. Um, and uh, the piece that she did that really de debuted her um, presence in, in a way in the art world, um, the, the thing that sort of put her on the scene, let's say, it wasn't her first artwork, but it was her the first thing that really put her in um, people's uh, put, put her on people's radar was this performance called Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir um, that she did in it was a performance persona um, that appeared in many places but two of the most famous of these were performances one at um, uh, one was at uh, just above Midtown Gallery and the other was at the New Museum. And in these performances, she dressed in a gown composed of pairs of white gloves, um, like, you know, the gloves that, that fashionable young women are taught to wear of a certain class. Um, and she carried, uh, she, the persona was that of an aging beauty queen from French Guyana. So she, her gown was covered with gloves uh, to represent the kinds of, um, I think now we might call it respectability politics um, that was very strong within her uh, Jamaican immigrant 
community. And in her other hand, in one of her hands, uh, a whip, a cat of nine tails whip, which as Lorraine says, is the whip that made the plantations move, right? So um, these sort of two, the sort of internal policing of, um, of uh, respectability politics and the external violence of literal uh, policing and violence and abuse of bodies. And uh, she did all of this in order to make a point about um, the art world, which she saw with this now vast life experience that had very little to do with the art world until she was sort of, you know, into her 40s. She understood the art world to be an extremely segregated place and a place where objective markers of talent didn't seem to work, right? So she had been successful despite the odds um, getting these sort of important government jobs, uh, running a, a translation business, doing all of these things um, that she was able to do because of talent, but she gets to the art world and suddenly the, the sort of markers of talent are so um, squishy that, um, you know, that, that success seems to have very little to do with, um, with actual objective, any objective markers and very much to do with um, whiteness and privilege and, and often masculinity. So her, these performances took place within art exhibitions uh, where she would decry in the case of the new museum, the segregation of the art world. Um, it took place at, the, at a show called The Nine Persona about nine performance artists and not a single black um, artist was in the show. Um, or it, at just above Midtown Gallery, it took place um, as a critique of artists who were not taking enough, of Black artists who were not taking enough risks and who were um, sort of um, hewing to politeness rather than challenging uh, racism in the art world. So Art Is, which was one of her terrific, uh, one of her performances that I think is is very well known now, but um, sort of happened under the radar at when it first um, took place, was a work in which um, she uh, was thinking about the something that a, co a, a colleague of hers, hers said, a person who, a Black woman who was an anthropologist, I think, who said to her, um, Black people have nothing to do with the avant-garde and the avant-garde has nothing to do with Black people, meaning that those structures were really not um, part of uh, the Black community. Um, and so she wanted to make an artwork, an avant-garde artwork, and kind of that demonstrated the ways in which um, the avant-garde was very much about um, Blackness and the way that Black people would respond to avant-garde art. So she decided to create a float that was uh, that would um, uh, that would go in the um, annual African American Day parade that took place in Harlem every year. Um, and uh, this float had a massive uh, gold leaf frame, open frame mounted on it so that the float itself would frame the views of um, the neighborhood. And there were dancers, 20 or so dancers, who were hired and who, um, and dressed in white, would uh, take these smaller gold frames and enter into the crowd um, and uh, hold up the frames in front of people um, to, and, and, you know, what was great for Lorraine, and she still tells this story, is that there was an immediate recognition of what was happening, right? Frame us, we're the art, people were, were yelling out. Um, people immediately responded to this, immediately understood what was happening. And so this became, um, for Lorraine, a really important demonstration of who was being left out of conversations on the avant-garde. Um, and uh, the ways in which 
the idea of the avant-garde could be sort of central or relevant to uh, people who museums, who critics, who, you know, uh, a lot of people were um, uh, leaving out. So Madame, Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir was obviously done in the guise of Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir. Um, Art Is was also a, a Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir production. And the third major thing that she did under that guise was the black and white show um, where she said, okay, um, what if we, in a sense, conceptually reduce the number of variables, right? What if we asked artists to contribute work to a show where the work had to be in only limited to black and white and where there were an equal number of black artists and white artists in the show? And would that start to demonstrate the ways in which um, art historical arguments about quality or um, you know, conceptual um, rigor or whatever the arguments were that the art world was using in order to exclude black artists. Could, if we did this, could we show that those um, criteria were in fact um, a bunch of baloney, that they were in fact uh, not, um, not real uh, and that um, black artists and white artists could be shown together on an equal footing uh, and make a great exhibition out of it. Now, this was in the early 80s. So, you know, I think that uh, it opened in 1983. I think that we have to sort of remember what museum shows were like at that time and how little um, museums felt the obligation to have any sort of sense of diversity among the artists that they showed. Uh, Black artists were, were even at this point, almost exclusively shown in exhibitions of Black art and uh, rarely included in uh, larger thematic exhibitions. So this was a sort of, uh, you know, proposition, conceptual exhibition proposition. You can see some of the names of uh, the people who uh, took part in the show. Uh, Basquiat unfortunately pulled out at the last minute, although she um, talks and writes about um, her long um, sort of negotiations with Basquiat in advance of the show. Uh, Keith Herring was one of her students. Um, she was teaching at the New School. She was teaching surrealist poetry and literature. Um, one of the most famous pieces that was produced for the show was John Fechner's Toxic Junkie mural um, that was done on the outside of, um, the, you know, outside the gallery uh, and has become, interestingly enough, a kind of almost motif of the East Village art scene in the 80s. Uh, you know, it's a very well known image. Uh, unfortunately and sadly, and this tells us a lot about art history and its exclusions. It is almost never mentioned that the mural was done for Lorraine O'Grady's exhibition at Ken Kaleba Gallery, um, a gallery that was very important, but that as a black run gallery was almost entirely ignored by the art press. Um, so, you know, uh, the fact that this, this mural was the product of a black curator show, you know, doing a show at a black gallery has been almost completely erased from um, the history of the East Village art scene. Uh, Adrian Piper um, contributed uh, this invitation to her funk lessons. The original invitation uh, was printed in gold, but Lorraine said, no, it has to be in black and white. So Adrian Piper did a one-off invitation in white um, so that it could be in the show. Uh, there were a number of performance works that Lorraine did in the early 80s, including River's First Draft. Um, which was done in a small corner of Central Park. Now, River's first draft in Art Is, what's interesting about these performances is she didn't, she, there, 
these weren't art world events and she didn't mean them to be. Art is only the people who were part of her small circle who were sort of directly involved in some way in the performance knew that it was happening. It was not advertised to the art world at all. It was done for the audience of the Afro-American Day Parade, period, right? River's First Draft, which is a performance that she considers one of the most important work she's ever done in her career, was uh, an invitation only event that took place in Central Park, maybe 40 people were in the audience. And we have documentation photos, but there's no video. Um, it was not, you know, it was not meant as a big public event, but it, um, was done, you know, it, it was uh, extremely um, uh, carefully produced um, because it has a very complex storyline uh, having to do with uh, her um, trying to find her footing, both as someone who um, straddled between cultures, her parents' uh, Caribbean origins, and her uh, upbringing in Boston um, uh, struggled with her trying to find her footing in an art world in which she was um, too much a woman to be accepted by black uh, artists, black male artists especially, um, and too black to be accepted by the white art world. And so this is really an early articulation of the kinds of intersectional oppressions that uh, we are much more familiar talking about today. One of the most interesting parts for me of Lorraine's work is the way in which she sees her own history, her personal history, as well as, uh, as, as part of these large, massive cultural and historical kinds of moments. So um, she, um, so this is a really interesting piece called Nefertiti Devonia Evangeline in which she aligned her, um, her family's uh, history, including um, the, her relationship, it really focuses on her relationship with her sister, Devonia Evangeline, who uh, died quite young. Um, and with whom Lorraine had a very fraught relationship that was sort of only beginning to be resolved at the point uh, that Devonia Evangeline died. And uh, Lorraine talks about going to Egypt and for the first on a trip to Egypt shortly after uh, Devonia Evangeline dies and realizing as she was sort of looking at the faces in the crowd that this was the first place that she'd ever been where people, she felt that people looked like her. She began to become very interested in the ways in which uh, Egypt was a kind of um, melting pot and ancient Egypt, especially a kind of melting pot between the kind of uh, what, what we might call sub-Saharan or Nubian cultures and uh, the Semitic cultures of North Africa that it, and she um, began researching uh, specifically the history of Nefertiti, Queen Nefertiti, because she believed that uh, her sister and Nefertiti bore a striking resemblance to each other. And as she researched, she found that Nefertiti also had a sister um, with whom she had a very troubled relationship. And so she uh, did a performance in which uh, you see, it, in which in the background she projected photos of her family with images of Nefertiti and her family. Again, drawing these two historically distant um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and um, historically different and, and sort of one sort of large uh, cultural moment uh, with the intimacy of family history together. And that eventually turned into a piece that um, uh, is called Miscegenated Family Album, in which uh, she um, sort of takes on 
these these juxtapositions, um, the way in which her family history sort of dovetails with this um, idea of, of um, ancient Egypt. Uh, she was doing her research on Egypt before some of the great research on um, Egypt as an African culture, ancient Egypt as an African culture had emerged. So she was doing this research very much in advance of the scholarly field. Um, and for her, it was, uh, again, the interest for her was this idea that it was the both andness, this is something that runs through all of her work, the both andness, the Africanness and the um, not Africanness of Egypt, that was what produced um, the, these, these, these sorts of cultural um, advances uh, in that area in the ancient period. And, and so she was aligning that sort of idea of hybridity as a productive and generative um, and uh, sort of model, a driver of culture with her own family's sort of hybridity, which was born of, of course, as a black uh, woman from the Caribbean, the hybridity of her family was, was born of a history of enslavement. Right, that um, you know, she understands blackness as um, necessarily hybrid. Um, it's black and it's hybrid, not it's one or the other. Um, and that, and she wants to think about the the reasons for that hybridity, um, especially when those reasons are those of uh, the violence and oppression of of things like slavery or indentured labor. And so that idea of miscegenation, right? Miscegenation is a kind of terrible word, but Lorraine wants to reclaim it as a way of forcing us to think about the way in which the, the West, especially the Western hemisphere has been produced through these mechanisms of um, enslaving uh, human beings, enslaving uh, people of African origin um, and that uh, it is only by understanding um, that those processes and the the, the kinds of um, uh, the kinds of culture as well as the kinds of people that emerged from that mixing that we can start start to begin to understand uh, where we've gotten to. So, Lorraine. As you'll ha maybe have noticed, as I've been flipping through these slides, uh, you'll see a lot of double images. Lorraine's preferred mode of working is the diptych. Um, and she says, you know, the reason for the diptych is um, because she wants to force this, this idea of thinking both and, um, and replace the West's uh, preference for thinking either or. She said, you know, when you think, when, when you put two things together, white and black, male and female, um, West and non-West, all of those things, you, you can say all you want that those things are on equal footing. But in fact, there's always power. There's always one, if you say black or white, one of those terms is always the lesser term. And so she is creating artworks um, that, that insist on the both and, that work according to this logic of the diptych, where, um, you know, in this case, one panel doesn't precede the other, one panel is not more important than the other. Those two panels have to be read um, simultaneously. And as you read them, more and more questions are raised and uh, the, the, the kind of endless back and forth of um, going from one to the other starts to undo the possibilities of settling on one fixed meaning. So, um, and, you know, sometimes those diptychs are, you know, take place in a single panel, like on the right uh, image called the fur palm in which a palm palm trunk grows out of the navel of a black skinned woman and on top of it is a fir tree um, relating to 
the sort of um, doubleness of Lorraine's own heritage as a black woman from the Caribbean who was raised in, um, in New England. Uh, and on the left is a picture, again, this house on wheels, um, again, uh, rolling on the body of um, a black woman um, and surmounted by images of uh, Lorraine's mother who you see the second from the left and her aunties. Um, I, oh, I wanna show quickly, cause I don't, I wanna leave enough time for questions, but let's see if this shows. No, I think I didn't update the URL. Um, Here, I'll end with this one. So, you know, as I said, Lorraine is sort of interested in the ways in which her own experience, her own family's experience, uh, her, uh, their experience um, in the long durée of history as people who were brought to the Caribbean likely as slaves um, and then, um, and then, you know, experience, you know, left the Caribbean at a certain point and immigrated to the U.S. Um, so she's interested in 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 aligning those experiences with those of sort of um, famous and sometimes not so famous historical figures. And uh, one of those figures is uh, the mistress of. Uh, Charles, the romantic poet Charles Baudelaire, uh, the mis his mistress's name was Jeanne Duval, who was a woman from the Caribbean who left there and moved to Paris in the 1860s, maybe 18, well, no, a little earlier than that, the 1830s. So, you know, maybe 75 years before uh, Lorraine's own mother left the Caribbean in order to move to Boston, right? So these two women who leave, two Black women who leave um, their homes in order to travel to the metropole uh, of Paris or of Boston. Um, and so uh, in this set of images, which Lorraine calls studies for the flower of evil and good, um, uh, which is a play on Baudelaire's famous um, collection of poems, study for the flowers, fleur de mal, or study for the or flowers of evil. Um, here she juxtaposes Baudelaire, um, uh, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, images of Jean Duval that we have from various notebooks, artist notebooks, and images of her mother in these. Um, sort of overlays and mashups. So, you know, Picasso's Demoiselle obviously representing the sort of modernist racist fantasy of the black woman. Uh, Baudelaire and Jean Duval had a famously sort of tempestuous relationship, but she was very much his muse. Um, uh, her mother as a figure whose life story replicated an important aspects, Jean Duval's and uh, Baudelaire's who, who, you know, is understood to be the kind of father of, of modernism, of Western modernism in a lot of ways, um, but whose work was very much produced in relationship with this Black woman. And so I think that the other thing that has emerged as we've been working on the exhibition is just this recognition that so much of Lorraine's work is arguing for um, the sort of um, centrality of Blackness to Western culture, uh, not as a, a marginalized culture, but really that Blackness has always been at the center and um, that uh, her work is sort of in a, in a sense unearthing both visually as well as historically unearthing the ways in which that occurs. So I will leave it at that and um, hopefully that leaves some time for questions and conversation. Thank you so much, Aruna. That was wonderful. Um, I'm sure people um, have 
have lots of questions and want to engage you. Um, and so if you do have a question for Aruna and you wanna type it out, you can put it in the Q&A box. Um, or I think everyone hopefully has the ability to raise their hands. If you want to ask your question verbally, um, raise your hand. Um, and I'll just kick things off with a question. I have a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> well, I don't even know where to begin, but um, one thing I was really interested in, in reading your introduction of Lorraine O'Grady's mm -hmm. work was the centrality of text and writing. And you, you foregrounded kind of her theoretical background. And now I'm also kind of trying to like work in this idea of the both and, which yeah. I, I love that as a paradigm for like how we move forward um, in, the, in the whole discipline of art history. Um, but I was wondering like where you see her writing in relation to all of these works or um, something that really popped out at me was like that she has kept up this website and this archive of writing. Um, and I was just wondering as a writer, if you felt besides the very cool D'Souza connection, um, <laughs> if as a writer, you felt that that was another kind of intersection or kinship um, because obviously Lorraine O'Grady has like such a handle on art history well, she, she does. And I think that that's, you know, I think that it's, it's so interesting. I mean, the first time I came across Lorraine O'Grady as a, you know, as a thinker was not through her art, but actually through a very important essay that she wrote um, in the early, in 1992 called Olympia's Maid. And um, that was uh, the first time that anyone had really, talked extensively about uh, the maid in Manet's famous painting Olympia, right? So, um, and, uh, you know, she, she again was interested there in um, thinking through the implications of that person, that figure, her life story, everything like that, and the way in which um, uh, her position as model was in fact, um, uh, typical of a life story at that time. And so, you know, that was a very important, theory, you know, sort of historical theoretical text. And that was my first, you know, realization of who she was. Now, if throughout the night, I, you know, I went to grad school in the 90s, and like, you know, the art, art form would arrive and <sighs> we would sit down and read it, you know, like religiously, or at least flip through it religiously, right? Because we wanted to know what was going on. <laughs> And, um, and I, I read a lot of art for him back then, but, you know, what's funny is that despite the fact that Lorraine was writing regularly for art for him in that period, I, what she was writing didn't register. In, in other words, I read it, but it didn't hold in my brain. And I think that one of the reasons for that was that she was so ahead of the curve in so many of the things she was talking about that um, that it really has taken a lot of people a long time to catch up to what she was saying, right? Like, you know, the themes that we're talking about in relation to her work now and, and her writing are things that, right, everyone's thinking about now, but they weren't necessarily thinking about it at the time that she was saying all this stuff. So there's this great piece that she wrote you know, in the early 90s, everyone was going crazy over the abject and the and form, right? Yeah. And all of these ideas of, um, you know, kind of um, degeneration and entropy and all of these things that uh, Rosalind Krauss and Yves Lambois and a lot of people were, you know, Julia Kristeva, a lot of people were talking about. And she, this fantastic critique of the the embrace of the am form and the abject a race-based critique where she said modernism modernism is reaching a dead end and so it has to the people who argue for modernism have to admit 
all the things that they excluded. They have to admit the degenerate. They have to admit the, the abject. They have to admit all of these things. But it is a move that is designed to keep the people that they have up until this point associated with those qualities, meaning black people, out of modernism, right? So they, so it was, so she understood it as a form of gatekeeping, right? Like in the early '90s, as more and more black artists are getting, um, are 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 becoming more visible in the mainstream, or as one of my colleagues says, white stream art world. <laughs> you, you create this category of the abject so that you can admit all of these qualities that you've assigned to black people without actually admitting black people. And the idea that I came across this as I was like, you know, doing my research and I was like, she was saying this in the early nineties and like, um, I, you know, like, you know, that it was like whoosh right over my head. Right. But now it's like, okay, there it is. That's exactly right. And, and we know that now, right? Like, so, um, so yeah, you know, her writing, you know, the, the other part of it is her writing has always existed in this both and relationship to her work. So she's writing Olympia's Maid, she's working on Flowers of Evil and Good, she's writing, um, you know, she's, she's uh, writing about um, uh, hybridity, um, she's uh, creating images like the fur palm, right? Like she, you know, these two things, um, you know, the, she's setting up these conversations between image and work, and then she writes about fur palm, and then she goes back to the writings on hybridity, and then she makes new work from it, and, you know, it goes on and on. And so that's one of the things that's so challenging about trying to put together collective writings or put together um, an exhibition is that her work, she sets up these conversations, right, endless conversations, you can never <laughs> settle on an answer. Um, and uh, and so the work just keeps changing and changing and changing. So, you know, she's going back now and reorganizing work that she did in like 1992 and deciding that it needs a new name, right? Because like, you know, she just refuses the idea that her work has a fixed form. And so, you know, that's really hard when you're trying to like make an exhibition or print a book, right? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> it's a real challenge. So. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's part and, but it's to be expected because it really is the motor that drives her thinking. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating what you're saying about Krauss and, and the abject and unformed, because then what, what the October group is like kind of admitting into the, the canon is surrealism and, yeah. and it's whiteness and racial problems or photography yeah. and, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, tot I'm digesting that, especially in the context when I see like an image like Fur Palm, which is like very indebted to totally. the surrealist idea, but now I'm going to think about it as the both and idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I, you know, I think that's exactly what she wants you to do in the sense that she is using all of these surrealist techniques of the collage, the photo collage and all of this stuff. She's, you know, she was at that point, she's teaching um, surrealism, surrealist literature at the new school, in addition to teaching like about Baudelaire and stuff, right? Like she, that's what she's teaching at the new school. So. Yeah, that just makes so much sense. I'm going to ask a question from my colleague, Natalie Haran. Do, um, do you want me to oh. unmute her and, and she can ask herself? Yeah. Beam me in. Hello. <laughs> can you all hear me? Yes, yes. We can. Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much, Aruna, for your presentation. And uh, maybe apologies in advance. I'm not going to ask you about Lorraine O'Grady. Oh, that's okay. Although maybe it figures in. Um, I wanted to ask if you could talk about your incorporation of social media conversations as a source in your criticism, particularly in the case of whitewalling. Sure. Um, I, I, I've noticed that nowadays a lot of uh, critical art conversations happen in the space of social media. And I continue to wonder what that means for the historiography of the field um, and, and what that means for our scholarship, really, in this ephemeral space of social media. Well, you know, um, in a way, so, so what I was struck by with, you know, when the Dana Schutz controversy sort of happened, right? Like, you know, 
what I was struck by is that on the one hand, you had all of these people, mostly um, black artists and writers who were having really consequential conversations and debates on social media about the painting and the stakes of the painting and the stakes of including that painting in the Whitney Biennial. Like really interesting conversations, really important conversations that had everything to do with um, questions of spectacle, of the continuing legacy of uh, racial violence, the, you know, all sorts of things. And then you had a bunch of people saying, free speech, free speech, you're trying to suppress free speech and artistic freedom. We can't even talk about this because free speech, free speech is the most important thing. And it was driving me nuts because it was such a clear demonstration of the way in which free speech was being used as like a cudgel to stop every conversation. And so that no one was actually listening to what were actually very cogent and not unified arguments that were happening among these really, you know, often really smart people who were, you know, coming across my newsfeed. And so, and, and I took part in a lot of those debates and I hosted a lot of those conversations on my own Facebook wall because I had so there was a point at which I left art history and I hadn't quite come, or I was just starting to come back into art writing. But there was this period of four or five years where I really, what I did was I was on Facebook and I was <laughs> and I really cultivated a, a pretty amazing kind of salon of people who were just, you know, who, who were talking about stuff on my Facebook. So, you know, all of this was happening and what, um, when Paul Chan first approached me about doing the book, one of the things I think we were both interested in is, is the question of how you turn this moment into a historical document, right? Like, you know, the artist space exhibition that I talk about in the second chapter of White Walling, there's an archive there. Like the, the artist space themselves kept every newspaper clipping from every independent weekly. They kept every piece of correspondence. They kept all of this stuff, right? There's, pa there's a paper, there's a bunch of paper files at NYU's library that you can go and you can see everything, almost everything that was ever written or thought or said about this exhibition. But what are people going to do about the Dana Schutz um, controversy? And so part of the reason that I wrote the book was that at least there would be some record of what people said. Um, and certainly it's not a full record. The only, the closest thing to a full record I can figure out is the artist Lauren Wood. But Lauren Woods um, took screenshots of everything that she saw <laughs> happening. And so if you ever want to know what, you know, the fullest picture of what, um, what went on, you know, that's who you'll call. But, um, you know, there, it did seem to me like there was a, there was an, there was something important about um, capturing at least the, the, the biggest contours of the debates from and admittedly from the imperfect um, vantage point of my social media feeds, right? Like, you know, that's the problem, right? We're not all seeing the same things. Um, but um, it felt like it was important to start to do that. Um, you know, I, I still think, you know, Artist Space kept all of the, um, infer, you know, all of the critique, all of the newspaper stuff, everything. Uh, from around that controversy at artist space, I always think it would be an amazing thing for the Whitney to actually decide to do a scraping of the social media archive of debate around um, around the Dana Schutz controversy as a sort of form of um, of owning up to their own culpability in 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 their decision making but whether or not they do that. <laughs> I'm going to invite Jennifer Barker to ask a question. Hi, Jennifer. 
You have to unmute. Jennifer? Oh. Oh, one moment. We can kind of hear you. You want to speak up? There we go. Are you able to hear me better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I had turned off my volume entirely because I wasn't sure if I was muted at first and I didn't want to disturb anything anyway. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm a BFA student at University of Houston. I think it's really wonderful to hear about these experiences. I think in my own art, um, I'm really grappling with a lot of these things from the other side that my family history is Confederate soldiers. It is uh, proponents of quote unquote, the lost cause. And so my current artistic practice is a lot more of what I'm considering at these times is really trying the best I can to listen to the voices of those my ancestors have ignored. Um, and so the, the question I'm interested in asking uh, what you were saying about art is and some of her other performances that she did not invite the art world. She was not invited, so she didn't invite them in a sense. Um, it reminded me of an art history class I had that talked about David Hammonds mm -hmm. in the 80s and like his blizzard sale and how um, you know, that was a very unpublicized event that I guess my question is, um, what do you think is the importance of marginalized artists holding their own events? And how, at what point does that bring them to the, the quote unquote main slash white table to where they can become more involved without having to create their own spaces? So that's a really interesting question. I love that you bring up the um, David Hammonds. I have to tell you that like, you know, my, my, my last boyfriend, um, uh, someone had sent me, we had just started dating and someone, and he was like this guy who was, he grew up in New York, but grew up as far away from the art world as you could possibly be. Um, knew nothing about art. One day someone had sent me a book on David Hammonds. And so uh, we were in the car and he's flipping through the book and all of a sudden he starts freaking out. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And he said, that's the guy, that's the guy who was always at Cooper Union. And my uncle always wanted to talk to him because he was selling the snowballs. And my uncle, one day he bought a snowball from him and put it in the freezer. And it was in that freezer for like years. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I had never heard of anyone who had actually like bought a snowball without knowing he was an artist, right? Like who had just like gone up and thought this was like the thing to do. And um, yeah, Rebecca, I see you, it was Brian. So just so you know. <laughs> um, the uh, and so I thought this was uh, I thought this was hilarious because it really was like the the there were these artists and Hammonds was of course associated with just above Midtown as well right and you know he and Lorraine knew each other certainly very early on in Lorraine's career um, and so you know there were these artists who were. But I think again, this was like a both and situation, right? Like there were, there, there, you know, I think that there were, there are a lot of artists who are really involved in creating these sort of spaces, um, uh, you know, that, that are, you know, for us, by us, right? That spaces in which they don't have to grapple with the kinds of gatekeeping um, and, gatekeeping both at a like a, a at a level of inclusion but also gatekeeping in terms of a, at, at a conceptual level as well right in terms of what sorts of things you can talk about and who you can talk to um, and at the same time that there is a really um, important consideration of do you want to give up the you know, resources? Do you just want to abandon the resources that other, you know, that mainstream institutions have and sort of have almost exclusively at this point? And so, you know, I think that, I think that that's, um, I think that that's, and, and, you know, and then the question, if you do 
um, participate in mainstream organizations and institutions, you know, how, how do you do so in a way where your work is not simply sort of co-opted um, by the institution and, and begins to serve their needs as opposed to challenge their um, institutionality. So, you know, I think this, I think all of that is a really, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, I think that there's a lot of different ways in which people are coming at that question. I think, you know, there's, you know, I love um, a pop-up gallery um, that operates in New York called We Buy Gold, which um, I think is doing some really great exhibitions, including a summer exhibition that they did uh, that was related to co the COVID crisis. Um, uh, you know, I think that there are um, people who are who are creating um, spaces even beyond exhibition spaces, um, you know, uh, the artist Caitlin Cherry uh, and some colleagues of her um, of hers, Nic uh, Nicole Malouf and Nora Khan are actually setting up uh, an alternative MFA program basically called uh, Dark Study. Um, and that has, uh, will be running this fall um, in order to create a sort of education space outside of the sort of structural terms of the university and all of the um, sort of inequity that the university sort of encodes. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of that happening. I think that none of the people who are participating in those things have, have sworn off working with um, historically white institutions or, you know, certainly not rich institutions. Um, and nor do I think we can expect them to like why, you know, like, uh, you know, the politics of renunciation is great, you know, except that it also leaves a lot of money on the table. I mean, I, I don't just mean money like personal lucre. I mean, you know, the resources one needs to get things done, right? So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe we'll take a question from the um, Q&A box. Um, Aaron Perizet was wondering if you could talk further about the significance of Lorraine O'Grady's relatively late entry into the art scene and how that in particular might have caused her to be more sensitive to the exclusion of the present art world. And I was also struck by that too. I mean, in some ways her having this uh, major retrospective now in her eighties, like fits the paradigm of the aging female artist finally being recognized, yeah. you know. And, and especially the black aging black female artist being finally recognized. Absolutely. You know, Lorraine, when we first, when Catherine and I first went, went for our first, you know, official studio visit with Lorraine, um, you know, she joked, Lorraine joked, you know, she said, I have basically 14 projects, <laughs> bodies of work, 14. <laughs> and she, she said, she said, I got into art so late that I didn't have time to make anything but masterpieces, right? Like, and I thought that that was such a great, and I thought that that was such a great, um, you know, she, you know, she, she really like, you know, she works in a way that takes time and that's painstaking and that is so much involved with editing and rethinking and reiterating and all of those things. Um, recycling in a, in a way, past work as well. Um, and uh, she, and, and so much of what has happened in her career, so much of the fact that she has a career is based on um, her making those opportunities happen, right? Her making the exhibitions, her making the space for performance. Um, you know, even you were mentioning before Sandra, the archive, right? She made that archive, uh, she was included in the 2007 exhibition WAC, uh, yeah. Feminist Revolution, really important exhibition. She was included in that exhibition and she realized that she was going to finally get some attention. So she better have a website so people could, I mean, she got her first, I mean, I think it was her first a uh, gallery representation in 2008, wow. right? That's, you know, she was in her seventies, right? Like, you know, th this is, 
And so, so much of what she was doing was on her own and on her own terms. And it's, um, and, you know, it's interesting now because, you know, because she is not used to um, what it means for, um, you know, that there's a museum there to like do some of this work or whatever, you know? And so, um, and, and so, you know, it, it's been a, it's that way, it's been a really fascinating, um, fascinating process. The, the, the thing about her starting late, I think this is, I think it's precise, the, um, it's precisely correct that, um, that, she that in in a sense her clarity about the segregation of the art world was in part because she was coming in as a fully realized adult with like <laughs> all, of these, um, all of these other professional experiences. So you know, here's you know she's she went to you know girls Latin in Boston, which is apparently a very academically accelerated sort of school in Boston. She went from there to Wellesley College as a black woman. You know, she wasn't the first black woman, but she was, you know, it was still not, you know, that common. Um, she was one of only two or something women at Wellesley to pass the national civil service exam and get into the civil service she, you know, so she had, she was this brilliant young woman who was getting by because there were these things, there were these like, you know, to get into the civil service, you took the test and you passed the test, right? And, you know, to get through girls Latin school, you took the test, you passed the tests, right? And there were all of these things where she had managed in a sense to exceed um, the limitations uh, that were placed at every turn on black people and on black women simply by because at the same time in certain areas there were these sort of objective things were you a good translator well you translate it if it makes sense you're a good translator right like there's like these there's these sort of objective markers and then she gets to the art world after having succeeded all of her life in these areas in which there were these subject, objective, you know, they're not entirely objective, but they're relatively objective kind of um, um, processes of evaluation. And she gets to the art world and, you know, and there's nothing of the sort, right? And so, you know, and, and she's, and she was acutely aware of that. And I think that very much um, determined that first set of performance works. She stopped performing really after um, 1983 um, because her mother got sick. And so she went back to Boston to take care of her mother and she only started making art again around 1990. And at that point she decided she was um, too old to, to put her body in front of um, an audience like that or in front of a camera. And so she, uh, turned to conceptual photography uh, and installation and other sorts of things. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Diane Tepfer. Diane, you have to unmute. Diane? <laughs> okay. Oh, it, it didn't ask. Oh. There you are. We can hear you. No, nope, now we can't. <laughs> okay. We can't. Well, she had her hand up. How about Debbie? Debbie Vu. Let's let's see if she would like to ask a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, when I was looking, uh, my teacher actually posted like a small excerpt of your. Um, book whitewalling in yeah. our uh, Google slide, um, Google um, Drive, and I actually read it, and I thought it was really um, thought provoking. I kind of wanted to ask, like, what um, personal thoughts or like personal commentary do you have regarding like white artists profiteering off of POC experiences or like suffering? So, I mean, 
you know, I don't think anyone should be profiteering off anyone's suffering, um, period. I mean, I think that there's, you know, but, uh, you know, I also want there to be, but I also don't want us to define artists talking about historical experiences of suffering as mere profiteering. Do you know what I mean? So I, I want, I don't want, um, I think there's a tendency for people to say, oh, this person is making an image about, you know, the history of slavery. And so therefore it's profiteering. Cause I don't think it's all, I, you know, I think that's too easy. Yes, we're all working within a money, in, within capitalism, within a money economy, we're all making a living. So, um, but you know, there's, there's, I think that for white artists to be taking up the um, stories of, um, the historical oppression and violence against um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. I think, you know, you have to be pretty fucking careful if you're going to do that, because the, the chances that it will um, either be appropriating or be read as appropriating are pretty much 100%, right? Like, you know, like, you know, I think, I think that, you know, I think that there has to be a way of doing that. Um, uh, I, I think that, that if there's a way of doing it, it very much involves um, a kind of focus on the culpability of whiteness um, rather than on the suffering of blackness or other, um, non-white identities. You know, I think a, appropriation is a pain in the ass. I think it's, um, I think it's, uh, it, it's annoying to see I'm South Asian. And if I see one more um, white girl profiting off yoga or um, <laughs> lattes or whatever, my head will explode. That said, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that we that people get especially upset about the appropriation of black experience is because the um the the reality right now that we're living in is uh we're living in white supremacy and that we're living in a place where black black lives um are are consistently um uh unvalued by the society in which we live and so um and so uh, of course, the appropriation of Black experience is going to hit differently, right? Um, I'm a firm believer that that if we ever get to a point where we, you know, pay reparations and um, actually structurally change this country, um, that people won't worry so much about appropriation. Uh, you know, these arguments about appropriation are very much arguments about the continuing oppression of blackness, um, you know, and that, and um, that, um, that in a sense, it's a proxy argument for that larger frustration. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, white artists don't do it or be super, do your homework or be very, very careful. Um, or better yet, spend a lot of time thinking about how whiteness produced the horrors that you're talking about, as opposed to just representing the horrors that you're talking about. Um, uh, yeah, so that's what I think. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question from the Q&A box. One of our art history grad students, Cami Tipton, um, was wondering if you could address um, Lorraine O'Grady's use of her beauty um, in her performance. Um, mm -hmm. And she gives the examples of pageantry, Nefertiti, and the muse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this could be quite a slippery area for a woman artist to address. Does she speak about her beauty as being an element of her body instrument in her performance? Cami feels that it can add levels of intrigue, intimidation, tension that add to the performance. And I, would, I, I was also intrigued by what you said earlier about at a certain age, she self-censored and felt that she was too old for performance. You know, think the famous performance artists of that moment, like 
Carolee Schneeman and Linda Banglis and Lorraine and, you know, even Adrian Piper and, you know, they're all attractive women, right? And so I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't think Hannah Wilkie, oh my God, Hannah Wilkie. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, yes, there, I think that there is a way in which I, Lorraine tells a story of going to Harvard to give a talk and um, the professor in the class that she was speaking to said, the, a woman professor said, isn't it weird how all the performance artists of that generation were so good looking? And she was like, yeah, I guess we kind of all were. Um, you know, I, you know I, think that, I think that there were a lot of debates at that moment um, about the um, stakes of offering the female body to the male gaze and um, and that sort of thing. And certainly like Lucy Lepard was like very much in the center of those arguments. And uh, Hannah Wilkie made a famous piece called Beware of Fascist Feminism. And it was a photograph of her with, you know, she put that gum all over her body. So she, it was a naked photograph of her with this gum all over her body. And it said, Beware of Fascist Feminism. And she put these posters up around Soho around the time that she was having an exhibition at one of the galleries. And that was a direct response to um, Lepard's critique of her and other performance artists who were using their body. But one of the things that Lorraine makes, um, uh, you know, makes clear in um, Olympia's made, but also, you know, uh, she sort of articulates it very clearly, but it comes through in a lot of her other writings as well, is that there's, there's, you know, one of the things about that made in Olympia's, in Manet's Olympia, is that she's almost invisible, right? That even, you know, even as her picture is painted, she herself doesn't have subjectivity in that picture. And that, that, um, you know, being visible as a Black woman when you're erased from the cultural landscape, right, from the art landscape, say the art world landscape, that's a, that has a different stake than um, maybe a white uh, female artist um, presenting themselves, or maybe it doesn't, right? Like, but, you know, I think that these, I think that these arguments about um, offering bodies up to the male gaze um, or the white gaze or whatever, they have to be seen in the context of what the possibilities of being seen at that moment are or were. Um, and I think that that is probably how I'd ask that question. And she did do that self-censoring, -cens right? She did decide that there was a um, moment at which uh, she felt that if she performed, um, as she moved into her 50s and, and older, that if she performed that too much attention would be paid to uh, the question of her age and her aging body. And she didn't want it. I don't think it meant she was embarrassed. I mean, she, she's, I mean, she's still the coolest woman that you'll meet, right? But um, she was, she, she remained like, you know, a kind of sexy rock chick way longer than anyone has the right to to do right um but she you know i don't think it was that she was ashamed so much as it was just a set of conceptual and visual and um aesthetic problems that she did not want to deal with and so then that was the point that she just removed herself but she also says i just want to oh i should just also say this she she really rejected the idea of um, she really rejected the suspicion of the beautiful generally, not just in terms mm. of female beauty, but also just in terms of aesthetic beauty. And like, like Kantian you know, beauty or? Yeah, like, you know, or just like, yeah, yeah, I think like, you know, I think that, you know, the 80s and, and the 80s especially, a lot of the idea around critical work was a kind of rejection of, you know, traditional aesthetic beauty, right? And so, and here she was making these images that were very beautiful, 
Um, and it was a way, and they were, you know, drawing upon surrealist techniques and they were narrative and they were, right? And so there, there were all these reasons that people looked at that and said, oh, that work is passe or derivative. But for her, it was, it was the insistence that the beautiful and the critical are both and they 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 don't contra they don't contradict each other they don't cancel themselves out they set into motion conversations that um, are unceasing. Thank so. you. Uh, Saren Alderson has her hand up. Let's see if she'd like to ask a question. Sarah, Hi there. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, I just, uh, I had a question about, so with cultural institutions kind of being more aware of not being as diverse as they probably should be, yeah. are kind of making this push to want to include more people. Um, but there is also a danger of like extreme tokenism that can come with that. Are there any good strategies that you could suggest for, you know, us as future artists or curators or art world, whomevers to kind of, avoid that danger of tokenism? Um, you could just hire all people of color <laughs> and no <laughs> one would be a token. Um, you can, I mean, I, I think that, I think that in a way, I mean, you know, I, I think that the conversations happily have moved way beyond the idea of tokenism because I think that, that, um, that people are really much, they're really very aware of um, the fact that there's structural change that has to happen to the ways that we understand what museums are, how they're funded, um, in addition to who works there that are necessary in order for um, these institutions not to be racist, right? Like, I mean, you know, yes, there is a problem of who you're hiring. The Metropolitan Museum, and the Guggenheim Museum both hired their first black curators. The Metropolitan was the first black curator of European painting and the Guggenheim was the first black curator period in 2019. In 2019, the first one. Um, and uh, so, and, and, and I would say neither of those people are tokens and I and I don't think even with the the problems of those institutions I don't think that anyone has the understanding that there's tokenism going on I think what there is an understanding is that um, there uh, you know that institutions are being really slow to hire um, people who are you know, in many cases, the most talented people in the field, right? Like, you know, what 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 is happening is that these institutions are leaving talent on the table, right? Like, that's what they're doing. They're they're prioritizing um, retaining their status as predominantly white institutions. Um, they're they're making that decision, you know, despite the fact that they're that they're. Um, you know, that there are better curators on the, you know, who, who are in the field and doing the work. Um, you know, so I think that, I think that the way that you um, avoid tokenism is that you put genuine resources and commitment and um, effort behind uh, the possibility of telling the stories of showing the art of um, people who are not white. Um, you make those resources available, you know, e in greater amounts than you have in the past to make up for all of the years that you weren't putting those resources for it. Like you, you make resources plus interest of, um, you know, uh, for all the time that you didn't do it in the past, and uh, you. Um, and you acknowledge the ways in which your hiring practice and exhibition practice in the past uh, failed um, to show the best artists, right? I mean, you know, all of these, you know, every, every time I see these exhibitions of like, you know, the 85 year old black artist who's having their first museum exhibition, what I wanna know is 
where the hell were all these other museums? If she's good enough to have an exhibition now at age 85, why wasn't she good enough to have, to show that same work, you know, when she was 65 or 55, right? Like this is, you know, I think that, you know, we're sort of at this point where we're just constantly celebrating museums for doing the absolute least. And, you know, we need to be asking those sorts of questions more. Like, I, I wanna know, why didn't you hire a black curator before 2019? Like actually say it out loud. Why did you not do that? You know, why didn't you show this? If this artist is good enough to be showing at age 85, why was this same work that you're showing in the show not good enough to show in, in when she was 65? I wanna know that. Thank you so much. These are like the questions that I think as a discipline, as an art world, like we have to keep asking and I mean, more than asking, but interrogating and pushing on. And um, your voice is, is, you know, the voice that leads us. So thank you. Um, thank I'm, I'm you. following a lot of voices. I mean, what I'll say is that, um, you know, I, I, you know, I thank you for your words, but I, I do want to say that the only, um, the only way that I've um, been able to make sense of the world in which we live and the art world in which we operate is because I'm spending a lot of time talking to and listening to and texting with, you know, um, black artists and writers and critics and, you know, indigenous artists and writers and, and so on um, to help me reorient um, my thinking and really unlearn so much of what I learned or absorbed in my years of schooling and writing. So, you know, I think that my biggest advice for anyone, I, you know, desegre desegregate your lives, right? De you know, that I think that's the most important thing that we can do. It doesn't matter what your political commitments are. It doesn't matter um, how, how correct your political positions are. Um, you know, you have to actively work. We all have to actively work to desegregate our lives. Some people, you know, I will say like there's an amount of self-protectiveness for people of color and not, um, you know, desegregating to the extent of surrounding themselves with white people. But <laughs> beyond that, for the rest of us, for uh, those of us who are not black, I think um, desegregating our lives is, is, is one of the most important things that um, we need to be doing, so. Thank you. And thank everyone. I'd like to thank everyone who was here tonight for this lecture. Um, and I hope you can join us on September 24th for Dean Nichols, who will be the second speaker in the University of Houston's 2020-2021 uh, speaker series. Thank you so much, Aruna. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all.